Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, continuing our studies in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we are focusing on the hollow men. The subject matter of the hollow men is indicated in the opening epigraph, just under the title and the date, 1925, three years after the wasteland. The epigraph that reads, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. When we go to the poem proper, The Hollow Man, there's another epigraph, a penny for the old guy. Now these are references to two hollow men, as it were, though they lived flamboyant lives. Our Kurtz, a figure in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, had gone up the Congo River back around the year 1900 and um, established a compound living among the natives. Uh, when Marlowe, who sent up to retrieve Kurtz from the jungle, bring him back to Europe, when he comes around a curve in the bend of the river, he sees the compound with some poles with human heads on them. It appears that Kurtz has made himself a god, perhaps accepting worship, human sacrifice, maybe, savage rites, certainly. He has a mistress who's a native woman, a sort of tiger woman. And um, then as he comes down the Congo River, he falls ill. And that leads to this epigraph announced scornfully by the cabin boy, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. The other character, Guy Fox, was a member of the group that perpetrated the gunpowder gun powder plot in England around the year 1605, when the English government was persecuting Catholics very severely, and Catholic leaders got together and devised a gunpowder gun powder plot. Uh, some 36 barrels of gunpowder powder were discovered under the parliament at a time when the parliament was about to meet and not only the politicians but the whole assembly of Anglican bishops would be gathered upstairs to be blown to pieces by the Catholics behind this plot. When the barrels were found a man was found lingering among them named Guy Fox and ever since that time Children in England have celebrated the victory of Protestant England over its Catholic conspirators on Guy Fox Day, which is uh, when the children would have a stuffed dummy that they toss around in the street and then knock on doors and ask for pennies to buy fireworks to celebrate this occasion. A penny for the old guy. Eliot's point, I think, in both of these epigraphs is that these were hollow men who lived flamboyantly. Or perhaps we could put it the other way around. They lived flamboyantly, but were in the end just hollow men. And what made them hollow, what indeed this whole poem addresses, is the problem of the burial of the dead. Back in the wasteland, Eliot addressed the ethical problems of the wasteland, we could perhaps rise above the level of animals in the way we treat each other if we follow the Hindu commandments, give, sympathize, control. But nothing can be done about the burial of the dead, about fear in a handful of dust, about your shadow rising to meet you in the evening, about the state of the crucified Savior, he who was living is now dead. That unresolved problem at the end of the wasteland reappears now as the central focus of this poem, The Hollow Men. What gives this poem extraordinary power? In my view, Eliot's greatest achievement, his most perfect poem, is the two voices in combat throughout this poem. 
We've seen those two voices previously in Eliot's poetry concerning this very same division, the poet in conflict with himself, the naturalistic intellect on one side, religious desire rising up to battle against the naturalistic intellect on the other side. We could go back to Preludes, that early poem, for the first such instance. Uh, in that naturalistic setting, the speaker was moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling, the notion of some infinitely suffering, infinitely gentle thing. Then that motif is wiped away, dismissed contemptuously. Wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. There is no such infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Instead, the world revolves like women gathering fuel in vacant lots. We had that same self-division in Gerontion, when Gerontion envied the Christians sharing a communion service in whispers, to be divided, to be drunk, uh, etc. Mr. Silvero walking in the next room, Hakagawa bowing among the Titians, Madame de Turnquist, Fräulein von Kalb, all of whom share uh, that Christian communion, the belief in a myth of rebirth in that context, whereas Gerontion says, I have no ghosts, no supernatural or spiritual realm of being. In the wasteland that we just looked at, that self-division comes about through the series of if clauses. He who was living is now dead, but if there were only water, if there were the sound of water only, the slightest hope in the wasteland. Here in this poem, The Hollow Men, the two voices reach on both sides their maximum intensity of expression. Uh, and they do it in the fewest images and the fewest words of any poem in Eliot's canon. So let's pick up now the two voices in section one. We begin with the voice of the naturalistic intellect telling us the way the world really is. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men leaning together, headpiece filled with straw like that stuffed dummy of Sky Fox. Now from this point on, the lines hiss with a very deliberate sibilance that Eliot puts there. Headpiece filled with straw, our dried voices when we whisper together, are quiet and meaningless as wind in dry grass or rats feed over broken glass in our dry cellar. The state of paralysis then, spiritually, because of the lack of a belief in rebirth, uh, comes up in the next two lines as shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed form, gesture without motion. The prospect of the permanent extinction of the self following our death casts its shadow on this life, making it meaningless as we go through it. That's the first voice, Eliot's naturalistic intellect acknowledging reality. The other voice, however, comes up uh, in what remains of section one. As the speaker envies Christians who can confront their death without fear. Those who have crossed with direct eyes, these are eyes that are bold and courageous, not afflicted by fear. Those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom. Now in this poem, death has two kingdoms. One is of course the realm after we die, death's kingdom. 
and that is described as death's other kingdom. The other realm that death looms over as its sovereign monarch is here and now in this life, which is described in this poem as death's dream kingdom. Uh, we remember at the beginning of Gerontion, an epigraph uh, from The Tempest, uh, stating that Gerontion's life has passed like a dream, making this death's dream kingdom. So coming back now to the end of part one, those Christians, believers at least, in some religious myth of rebirth, those who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom, remember us, here and now, if they remember us at all, not as lost, violent souls, not as Guy Fox or Kurtz, but only as the hollow men, the stuffed men, pathetic figures. So the judgment goes against us hollow men, uh, not those who could direct, excuse me, cross with direct eyes, brave eyes, to death's other kingdom. We're the ones who are empty and pitiful. Part two brings us again, the two voices in combat. And we pick up with the motif of those eyes that crossed courageously without fear to death's other kingdom. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams. So there is some sense of judgment against the hollow man. We remember this from Gerontion, where though Gerontion is not a believer in the Christian faith or any other, nonetheless he does have a sense of being judged by Christ the tiger. And, of course, these tears are shaken from the wrath-bearing tree. A similar sense of judgment against Gerontion, who was a hollow man back in his time. Judgment here also on the part of those eyes looking at us and judging us as pitiful, hollow creatures leading a meaningless life. Eyes I dare not meet in dreams in death's dream kingdom here and now. These do not appear there with those believers. The eyes are sunlight on a broken column. Uh, the verse texture, by the way, the rhyme scheme here is especially successful, I believe, a very lyrical quality, and this time not with the purpose of sarcasm or irony. The eyes then of believers represent sunlight on a broken column. The broken column, yes, here in the world, it's still something of a wasteland, but with sunlight. And um, there is a tree swinging and voices in the winds singing. Uh, we could surmise possibly angel voices that Christians have access to, like access to the sunlight. Um, voices in the wind singing, but for the hollow men, those voices are more distant and more solemn than a fading star. Now, the star would seem to be at least a glancing reference to the unfading star over Bethlehem, bringing the wise men to worship the Christ child in the gospel story. The fading star for the hollow men would be simply any hope of believing in the next world, that whole dimension, that realm of potential being uh, is indeed disappearing because of the inability to believe. We end part two of the poem with the naturalistic intellect describing its predicament. Let me be no nearer in death's dream kingdom, nearer presumably to those Christian voices or eyes uh, that displayed belief. Let me be no nearer because, 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 perhaps because of the judgment that's being exercised in death's dream kingdom. 
And we have something like the social mask that dates way back to portrait of a lady or even to proof rock to make a face, to prepare a face that is to meet the faces that you meet. And that's what the hollow men have to do by way of their social arrangements to hide their hollowness. So let me also wear such deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, crossed staves like a scarecrow, in a field be behaving as the wind behaves no nearer. Not that final meeting in the twilight kingdom. The final meaning, of course, is the point at which one crosses to death's other kingdom. And that does occur in the twilight kingdom between death's dream kingdom here and now and thus death's other kingdom afterwards. Part three of this poem brings us both of these voices in their absolute maximum power. We begin with the voice of the naturalist intellect describing actual reality. This is the dead land. This is cactus land. Here the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. Now we need to linger a moment over these spare but extremely powerful images. Here in this dead land, this cactus land, this wasteland now become an ultimate desert, here the stone images are raised. The question is, what stone images? Now I think the best answer is that these represent the various efforts of humankind to establish a myth of rebirth. We could think to the pyramids of Egypt. We could think to Stonehenge. We could think to the figures on Easter Island. We could think of the cathedrals in medieval Europe. For that matter, we could think of the monuments in a contemporary graveyard. All of these represent a wish for immortal life. In uh, this poem, these images are raised to that purpose, but here those images receive the supplication of a dead man's hand, another very powerful image. The man is dead. He has no voice. He cannot ask for immortality, but his hand is still in a posture of supplication, pleading for immortality. Of course, uh, there is no div divinity to answer that plea. It's only the stone images that receive it under the twinkle of a fading star. Once again, the whole realm of another world better than this one disappearing from the heavens, from any possibility of reality. That is the voice that begins section three the naturalistic intellect acknowledging reality. We proceed then with the other voice rising in combat against it. Spontaneously, it seems, in, from some deep resource in T.S. Eliot's being. With the question, is it like this in death's other kingdom? And then we have this very intense religious mood. Waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness. This is a mood of religious desire. Trembling with tenderness. Lips that would kiss. This is not a sexual kiss. This is the sort of kiss that one would apply to an icon. Lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. These are the prayers of an unbeliever. They're rising up spontaneously in the speaker, who obviously is T.S. Eliot. Uh, and uh, they cannot be suppressed. They keep boiling up. But 
in the end, the naturalistic intellect wins the combat. These are prayers only to broken stone. In part four, for the last time, we see that combat reenact itself. We start off with the voice of the naturalistic intellect telling us the way things are. The eyes are not here, certainly no eyes of faith that could see the star that is not fading or that could see the other world that the, that star represents. The eyes are not here. There are no eyes here in this valley of dying stars, in this hollow valley, this broken jaw of our lost kingdoms. And so you might say on the banks of the river, uh, which one would cross to death's other kingdom, we have the psychological impact of that lack of belief. That is an intensifying of this loneliness that has dominated Eliot's poetry so largely up through this point. In this last of meeting places then, on the banks of that river presumably, we grope together and avoid speech gathered on the beach of the Tumid River. You may remember in the wasteland, in the conversation between husband and wife, in the game of chess, the upper class couple, the woman complained to her husband, you never speak to me. Why don't you speak? I never know what you're thinking. His answer, not in speech, but in his own man, his own mind, was, I think we're in rat's alley when dead men lost their bones. That's why we uh, grope together and avoid speech, waiting for the end on the banks of the river. Now up to this point, it is the intellectual voice of naturalism that is speaking part four. We end with the other voice, rising up once again to struggle against the naturalistic view of life, uh, that last stanza of part four introduced with the word sightless, that's the way things are. We don't have that kind of metaphysical vision that people who cross with direct eyes to death's other kingdom have. So we are sightless, and then suddenly a, a subordinate clause comes into play. Sightless unless the eyes reappear the eyes of faith, the eyes reappear as the perpetual star. Well, that would have to be the star over Bethlehem, the star of Christian faith. Multifoliate rose. The rose is a symbol of the incarnation of Jesus, the incarnation of God in a human body. That's why we have rose windows in cathedrals. So an upsurge of religious desire yet again, this time in a subordinate clause. And uh, it has to be suppressed and is in the last two lines of section four. The perpetual star, the eyes reappearing, the multifoliate rose, all of this is the hope only of empty men. Vain religious desire as we end section four. Now in section five, we have a unified voice. The naturalistic intellect has prevailed over that voice of religious desire. And so we conclude with the way things really are and we, which we must acknowledge. We conclude with the parody of a Christian worship service to represent the triumph of the naturalistic intellect. We begin, as elsewhere in Eliot, with a child's nursery rhyme containing adult perspectives. Here we go around the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go around the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. That, of course, amongst other things, is the motion of the wheel turning. Uh, a wheel making meaningless cycles of repetition. 
we proceed with what seems to be a parody of a Christian worship service, something you might see in a Catholic or Anglican Episcopal service. We could say it might be the priest who makes the assertion reading the liturgy between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. The emphasis on that first accent, falls, gives it the force of a guillotine, falls the shadow. And the shadow with a capital S clearly is the shadow of death. It reminds us of the most famous of all the Psalms, the 23rd Psalm. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. So were the feelings of the psalmist hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. Here, of course, the shadow of death does not offer such consolation. And so we end that part of the liturgy, as it were, between the motion and the act falls the shadow. And then in italics, the congregation does its part. For thine is the kingdom. This is the way a liturgy occurs in a Catholic or Episcopal service, with the priest chanting some verses and the congregation then uh, making a reply. Now, for thine is the kingdom, capital T and capital K on thine and kingdom, is part of the Lord's Prayer, the most famous prayer in Christendom, stated by Jesus himself as a model of how to pray. This is how you do it. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done thy, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Um, thy kingdom come is one of the lines early on in the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer ends with this line, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Now here, because of the lack of the possibility of Christian belief, we have to make a substitution. The word thine refers to death, not God. This is after all death's kingdom, death's dream kingdom here and now, death's other kingdom after we physically die. And between the two of them, we take up all of reality. It's all death's kingdom, hence thine is the kingdom. As we proceed in this parody of a Christian worship service, uh, once again, a interchange between the priest and the congregation. The priest reciting between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. The congregation replies, life is very long, uh, obviously, a statement attended by irony. And then we go on with a third of these verses from the liturgy, between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, um, between the essence and the descent falls the shadow. We repeat again this revised version of the Lord's Prayer for thine is the kingdom. And then the syntax breaks up, as though the speaker can no longer even complete his sentence. For thine is, life is, for thine is thee. We conclude the hollow men with yet another version of a child's nursery rhyme, but this time it also has the tone of the liturgy with the naturalistic substitution as the case requires. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. We have seen both the bang and the whimper in this poem. The bang would refer to Kurtz and of course to Guy Fawkes who literally went out with a bang, with a gunpowder plot. Kurtz and 
Guy Fawkes lived flamboyant, very active lives. They indulged their appetites. Uh, Kurtz uh, was a man uh, represented by an enormous yawning, open mouth, as though he were pr pure appetite and filling it, of course, uh, without any restraint in that uh, context up the Congo River. So those men went out with a bang. Uh, the hollow men, of course, are something else. The rest of the hollow men, the ones who dominate this poem, including the speaker, they went out not with a bang but a whimper. The whimper is the plea for immortality that we saw earlier in part three of this poem. Namely, the section where Eliot describes the stone images are raised. Here they receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. That was the whimper. And once again, as back in preludes, this is a form of embarrassment, this whimpering, this plea for immortality, this refusal to acknowledge the reality that there is no supernatural domain, there is no spiritual realm to existence, there is no answer, satisfactory answer, to the burial of the dead. And so, really, we must stop whimpering. So ends the hollow man, with Eliot rebuking his own status as a hollow man and ridiculing his own religious desire as the poem ends. This would be the last time we see Eliot concluding the battle of the two voices in this fashion. Two years after this poem was published, he would announce his conversion to the Christian faith. And three years after that, in 1930, he would publish his first major Christian poem, Ash Wednesday, in which we still see two voices, but this time the preponderance of power between them is reversed. So we'll leave that for our next session and conclude this session on the hollow men here.